wish his shoe wasn't lousy. Yeah, two hours and not even a bite. Let's make a wish it'll be better tomorrow. <laughs> Rosalind, if wishing did any good, I wish for a new bicycle. <laughs> this old crate needs a doctor. <laughs> This is a scene from All the Money in the World, a TV movie that aired on ABC Weekend Special in 1983, based on a 1979 book of the same name by Bill Britton. In it, a young boy named Quentin helps out a leprechaun from a jam, and as a result is gifted wishes. Quentin wishes for all the money in the world, and as a result, every piece of currency from every nation in the world is teleported into his yard. At first it seems cool to have literally all the money, but it sends the rest of the world into chaos. Quentin can't spend it or give it back, and he attempts to do so just has the money magically returned to him because only he has all the money in the world. And he attempts by the rest of the world to create replacement currencies just results in the new money going to Quentin. Now it's an interesting story with a lot of potentially deep commentary. You could spin this into a tale of economic stability, understandable to children, comment on the construct of currency by showing how easy it is to just make more. You could weave a cautionary tale of the controlling nature of capitalism, how money is symbolic representation of labor and how undervalued that labor actually is. Quinton's actions effectively cut off the head of capitalism, an act at first seeming apocalyptic, but then enlightening. After all, isn't a moneyless society the socialist future envisioned in the works of, like, Star Trek? But then, if we cross-check this story with some of the author's other works, we can discover a common theme. And that theme is this. Bill Britton really hates it when kids wish for things. When I was a little girl, I had desires like you. One of everything, all the riches had. The Wish Giver by Bill Britton was published in 1983 and was the second of four books set in Coventry, a sort of simple turn of the century St. Petersburg, Missouri type town, except for the fact that it used to be the site of witch activity in Devil Worth. The introduction describes it as such. Imp and fiends and all the rest of Satan's spawn have appeared here from time to time, taking their pleasure from plaguing and frightening us poor mortals. Some folks even tell of seeing the devil himself walking about and looking for souls to claim when the mists hang low on the mountains. Whatever happened in Coventry way back when has caused it to be an attractor to a lot of malicious evil forces, devious strangers preying on the goodwill of the simple country folk living their simple country lives. You know that Ray Bradbury book, Something Wicked This Way Comes? It's like that, only it happens every other week. This time, our Mr. Dark is Thaddeus Blinn, a creepy traveling salesman who's selling wishes out of his tent. For 50 cents, you get a card with a red dot on it. Press your thumb against the dot when you're ready to make your wish, and you can receive whatever it is you desire. Blinn receives four customers that day, Stew Meat, the proprietor of the Coventry General Store, and three children, 11-year-old Polly Kemp, 15-year-old Rowana Jervis, and 16-year-old Adam Fisk. Polly is a loudmouth tomboy who wants to be friends with the well-to-do popular girls at school. Nobody seems to like her, and she can't figure out why. So that's her wish, for people to pay attention to her and smile when they see her. When she goes to school the next morning, nothing seems to have changed, but when she starts to complain or act rude or slag off some of her fellow students, the only thing that comes out of her mouth is the croak of a frog. Jogarum. Jogarum. Polly is magically prevented from saying negative things, meaning she has to be nice to her fellow students, and hey, they are being nice to her in return. But still, if she ever gets upset, out comes the jogarum. Rowana is a romantic and heads over heels for another traveling salesman, Henry Piper, who comes around once a year to sell farm equipment. And it seems Henry's sweet on her too, which is kinda creepy since he's a grown ass adult, but alas, he can't stay. His business takes him across the country. So Rowana wishes that Henry will set down roots in Coventry. And he does. 
literally, roots come out of the bottom of his shoes, planting him in an out-of-the-way spot in Rwanda's backyard. Rwanda can't help but watch as Henry is slowly turned into a tree, but in the process, learns just what a rotten person Henry actually is, playing sweet with all the farmer's girls so that their fathers will buy his stuff. Rwanda dodged a bullet, but what now will they do with the transforming Henry? Adam's family farm isn't doing so well. There's just no easily available source of water on the land. So Adam spends every day wheeling barrels back and forth from the creek miles away. It's exhausting work with very little result. His family will always struggle with his farm. So he wishes that the farm had all the water it needs and then some. Suddenly geysers of water burst out of the ground all over the land. At first it's pretty exciting, but the geysers don't stop. And only after a couple of days, the entire farm has flooded. Three wishes, twisted by unknown forces to ruin your life. It's fitting that this is the next request to come up. The last video on this channel was the Goosebumps book, Be Careful What You Wish For, which is also about a young person getting wishes that end up getting corrupted. It's a popular idea for a story. Some people, including myself, have referred to it as the monkey paw story, mostly in reference to that one Simpsons story, but the monkey paw originates from a 1902 story by W.W. Jacobs, where a family comes across a mummified monkey paw that's said to grant three wishes. The father wishes for 200 pounds to pay off his mortgage, and it results in his son dying in a factory accident, with the factory paying out 200 pounds in compensation. The story quotes the popular idiom, be careful what you wish for, you may receive it. The exact origin of this phrase is unclear. Some associated with German author Johann Wolfgang von Goth, though his version didn't have quite the same implications. Some say it's an old Chinese proverb, but nobody can really find said proverb. Like a lot of idioms, its exact origin and context may never be rediscovered. So how do we use this idea today? How does the idea apply itself to the wish giver? In the monkey's paw, the titular artifact comes from India, an evil token of a non-Westernized civilization. The wishgiver isn't nearly as xenophobic, but it does have a small town isolationist attitude that puts a line in the sand between Coventry and the rest of the outside world. Thaddeus Blinn is an evil presence because he's an outsider. He doesn't belong in this close-knit community. The same is true of Henry Piper. He's not just an outsider, he claims to be a worldly outsider, having traveled all across the globe with many tales to tell. Plus, you know, being a creep who flirts with teenage girls. Both of these people and the monkey's paw are corrupting external forces, so you better keep your borders safe and don't allow any of those refugees in. They might bring with them perverting magics. What makes this idea odd for the Coventry series is that the town was originally the source of witchcraft and devil worship. It was originally corrupted and these strangers are attempting to bring that corruption back. In contrast, the citizens of Coventry are hard-working, God-fearing folk taken from the whitest pages of Mark Twain. Well, of course these witches and devil worshippers would have been European colonialist descendants. Thank God these books didn't frame it as Coventry being on quote-unquote Indian ritual grounds. There's still a pagan othering that Coventry acts as a Christian colonial conquering of. This is emphasized in the book with Thaddeus Blinn selling his wish cards during the town's church social. While the book is not explicitly religious, it does play around with the ideas of miracles versus the natural order. While Adam's farm is flooding, two characters witness it and have a discussion that sounds like it came right out of Inherit the Wind. As Adam walked up the hill to the high ground, he heard Jonas Colby, the station master, arguing loudly with Wilbur Baldwin, who taught science at the high school. Con it, Wilbur! Mr. Colby was saying, you can talk until you're blue in the face about underground rivers and rock strata and all that rubbish, but how in tarnation do you explain them things? Wells, called Artesian Wells, sometimes come up, began Mr. Baldwin. I don't give a hoot if every artist in the world has got a well, interrupted Mr. Colby with a cackling laugh. There's nothing in any of your almighty science books to explain how water can be shooting out of the ground like that. Admit it. Here's one of the things you don't know beans about. The wish giver sees a certain kind of purity for a certain kind of living in a certain kind of time, and anyone wishing it could be anything else is letting an evil influence like other cultures and secular thoughts, and you better keep an eye on what that science teacher is filling our kids' heads with. Yeah, I'm not a fan. But there's gotta be more to this. After all, all the money in the world is set completely outside the Coventry setting. It has nothing to do with American Gothic nostalgia but still has the same basic be careful what you wish for plot. 
So what else can you say about this idea? Well, a wish is just a fancy way of saying you want something. They don't have to be lavish things. Man, I really wish our professor would knock it off with the pop quizzes. I really wish the grocery store was open at 3 a.m. so I could score some donut holes. Heck, the main wish in the monkey's paw is extraordinary in how unextraordinary it is. They don't wish for riches or fame or power. They just want to pay off their bills a little early. The wishes in the wish giver also seem pretty minor. I want to be liked. I want to be with the guy I love. I want the farm to succeed. What connects these wishes is that they all, in some way, deal with status and money. Polly doesn't just want to make friends. She wants to be friends with the rich girls in her class, to be invited to their fancy tea parties. Only after getting invited does she realize how phony it all is, that her real friends are the poor kids catching snakes down by the creek. This is the best segment of the book, for the record. It's the least horrifying wish result. It seems to have a handful of decent morals about how you should be nice to people and how status isn't everything. You know, good lessons for children. It's also largely straightforward. If this was the whole book, I wouldn't have much to complain about. Rwanda's riches is for love, but specifically for the adventurous, globe-trotting man who could show her the world. The fact that this is a minor trying to hook up with an adult isn't really touched upon. What's important for the book is that Rwanda learns that Henry is a liar taking advantage of her crush. However, instead of Rwanda discovering a level of independence and how she doesn't need no man, when the farmhands go, Hey, you should date me instead. I'm a nice guy. And she gets with him instead. The moral isn't so much about being tricked by sleazebags so much as it is about settling. Adam's story is kind of the weirdest of the bunch. Not in what actually happens, a wish resulting in a flooded farm isn't too crazy. In fact, it's outright boring compared to the previous two. But it doesn't seem to fit into the framework of the rest of the book. Adam isn't looking to rise above his station, he's just looking to find success within his station. And the end result is the farm being a total loss. The only lesson here is that one shouldn't find shortcuts, I guess, but it's not very well communicated. If it's a struggle to make ends meet, well, just deal with it, slacker. Now, there's very little biographical information available on Bill Britton. He didn't give any interviews that I could find. But we do know that he was a child of the Great Depression. He would have known an America where things didn't come easy, work wasn't guaranteed, and you had to make do with what you had. His adulthood saw the rise of what might seem like capitalist excess, including an expanding market towards young children. Consider that the popular use of wishes at the time came from Disney films, who may as well have trademarked the word wish. Make a wish and choose a well, that's all you have to do. And if you hear it echoing, your wish will soon come true. A dream is a wish your heart makes when you're fast to see. Upon a star, your dreams come true. The wishing in Disney's output was entirely positive. The films are childhood wish fulfillments that say that magic and happenstance will get you what you want, which is quite the fantasy for kids who might not have been having supper every night. I obviously can't speak for Britain, but I can imagine being wary of such sentiments in future generations. What might seem like a well-meaning fantasy to Great Depression kids would seem like the status quo for future generations, an entitlement towards when you wish upon a star. A sentiment perhaps not unfounded when you see the general attitudes baby boomers have towards struggling millennials. The book was written during a time when the children's market was slowly ramping up to its 1980s excess. Hell, now there's an entire cable channel dedicated to kids. While at the same time, the United States was being peppered with a couple of mini recessions. Not to mention the oil crisis wasn't even 10 years old yet. We were at a point where kids were being told that nothing could go wrong, when in fact things could go horribly wrong. You can really feel this in All the Money in the World, where Quentin's wish for everything reveals how fragile these systems really are. Again, I don't know Britain's headspace, I don't know what his intents were, but his children's books seem to offer an alternative to Disney wishes, showing us how wishes don't do us any good in reality. I can kind of respect that sentiment, but I think it has a nasty side effect, especially when these books are taken out of that greater context. The Wish Giver, All the Money in the World, 
hell, let's throw in be careful what you wish for for good measure, they all tell their young readers, don't have wants. Don't express your wants. Don't pursue your wants. Be happy with what you're stuck with. And yeah, kids should learn that they don't need a Super Nintendo. But what about kids who wish they weren't in an abusive family? The kids who wish the bullies at school would leave them alone? The kids who wish they could express their inner identities without getting hurt? These stories don't make any distinction between the want of things and the want for a truly better life. And saying that wishing is a bad thing is closing off a means of expression for kids who might need it. It's telling them that they should suck it up and keep living these harmful lives and not seek betterment. That's almost certainly unintentional, but intent doesn't matter as much as results. And for the wish giver, the result is a nostalgic image of a whitewashed, Christian-only America where wanting a better life is magically punished with your voice being taken away, your outsider friends being murdered, and your means of living completely destroyed. We can only wish for better stories.